My name is Dr. William Barnes, and I'm a general surgeon. I practice in uh, Salem, Kentucky. I've been a general surgeon for 30 years. I trained at the Cook County Hospital in Chicago, and I'm going to talk today about GERD and specifically the TIF operation. I've been doing surgery for or treating patients with GERD for the last 30 years. So, um, what I usually tell my, and what I'm going to tell you is going to take about 15 minutes. I'm going to leave some things out that you can get on the web and on the internet if you want such as dietary restrictions because GERD is actually a medical problem and only those people that don't respond to medication and treatment or those who don't want to take medication are those are candidates for repair. <coughs> so what I tell my patients is that uh, we would all have gastroesophageal reflux disease uh, if it weren't for this mechanism that God put in here for us. If you can imagine, I'm going to draw some pictures, if you can imagine this being your esophagus and this being your stomach and if you can imagine this being your diaphragm the diaphragm is a muscle that separates the chest from the abdomen this is your esophagus it has a particular cell line and these two cells meet stomach and esophagus and <clears throat> we would all have reflux because the Lord made this mechanism in our chest in order for us to breathe uh, he put a space between the lung and the chest wall it's not really a space it's a potential space and the pressure in that space is negative negative. and so when our chest expands and our diaphragm expands that causes our lung to expand air is exchange in our lungs uh, the, if I stick a needle in your chest, you'll hear the ambient air pressure suck into your chest, and you'll have an, actually have a sucking chest wound. You'll hear it suck into your chest. Your lung will collapse. Whereas if I stick it in your belly, if I take a needle and I stick it in your belly, you won't hear anything. That's because the, there's a pressure gradient. This has a lot of negative pressure. This has a very little negative pressure. So in actuality, compared to this pressure, it's a positive pressure, and there's a tendency for everything to get sucked up into the chest. And what prevents us from having that is a distance from the diaphragm, an angle, and a valve here. We can overcome those because those are natural things, but if you eat too much or you drink too much carbonated beverages, you'll have that trouble. And we know all about this because we've been studying this for about 50 years. The first surgery that we did back in the 50s was called the Nissen fundoplication, and I'm going to get into that in a minute, and I'm going to show you that. But because of that operation, which was done around the world on billions of people, many, many studies were done, we know about this mechanism. So if a patient has reflux, typically, if they don't respond to medicine, they have an anatomic problem. And that problem, if you can imagine this being the esophagus, and that junction, which is supposed to be below the diaphragm, is actually above the diaphragm. And that stomach slides up and down above the diaphragm. If you can imagine this being your stomach, and then it comes down below the diaphragm, and this being your diaphragm then, here. So this, 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 this whole apparatus then slides up and down. When it's down in the appropriate condition, you don't reflux. And when it's up, you do reflux. Now you can control that with diet and exercise. There's even some chiropractic maneuvers that can push the, this mechanism back into the abdomen, but it won't hold there. And if you don't respond to medical treatment, to changing your diet, uh, going to bed in an empty stomach, um, not drinking carbonated beverages, staying away from alcohol and tobacco, then you may continue to, 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 to reflux. There's small little attachments that prevent the connection between the two cavities, but when we operate on patients and we go in there with a laparoscope or open and we look up in that area, you can actually see the stomach sucked up into the diaphragm, up into the chest. And if you pull the stomach down and let it go, whoop, back up it goes, it goes back up into the chest. And so um, the, our object to try and get this surgically repaired is to take this and turn it into that. 
and that's the object of all of our surgeries. Um, when you take medication, what that does is it stops the acid in the stomach. Now when you stop the acid, <clears throat> that stops the pain and heartburn because the acid hurts your esophagus, but it does not stop the reflux. So now you're refluxing non-acid materials such as pepsin, bile, uh, non-acid secretions. They still cause damage, they still cause aspiration. Patients that have chronic sinus issues, <clears throat> clearing their throat all the time, coughing all the time, and typically that's what happens. And that's from chronic reflux. And if they've been on a PPI for any length of time, uh, they may not have heartburn, but they still have these symptoms. Now, if you look on the index of the box on their PPI, which would be Prilosec, Nexium, Protonix, it tells you that you should take this medication for about two months, two to four months, and change your habits and then get off the medication. They do say on the box that long-term studies have not shown any problems. So typically people are on this medication for years and years and years. But if you look at the fine print on that medication, it says you shouldn't be on, the only long-term studies they've done have been six months. And now we know that there's a lot of problem with that PPI. There's even a warning on the box now from the FDA about issues related to absorption of calcium and minerals. Because you take the, think about it for a minute, if you take the acid out of your stomach, that acid, the Lord put that acid there for a multitude of reasons. And now you've lost immune function, it, it, the acid that protects you from bacteria is gone. You have uh, lo loss of absorption of minerals and nutrients that you need when you eat. And so it, over the long term, it's, it, it's not a very good thing. As a matter of fact, when the um, earthquake occurred in Haiti, uh, if you wanted to go and help those people in Haiti, uh, you'd have to answer a questionnaire from the CDC to be allowed to go over there. And one of their questions they asked was if you were on this medication. And if you're on that medication, they would not allow you to go because it affects your immunity in such a way that you would be a danger. So I'm going to sit down for a minute. Recreate this natural uh, situation. Now, we're not God, so nothing is perfect, but we can do some things. And originally, when we first started doing these surgeries, it was in the 1950s, and it was called a Nissen Fundoplication. Now there were several other operations around that uh, trying to recreate this and, and there's variations of this operation but the main operation for this circumstance was the Nissen Fundoplication. Because of this Nissen Fundoplication we know all there is to know about this because this was done from the 50s, the last 60 years, many 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 studies on all around the world so we know about this operation and we know how it works and why it works. Actually it's why we know more and more about reflux is because of that. In the 90s we started doing what was called a laparoscopic Nissen fundoplication. Now that operation Today is the most common operation done, and I'm going to explain to you why in a minute. And we know it is, a, it is a variation of this, but very, very similar, only done laparoscopically. And now we have what's called the endoscopic fundoplication, or the TIF, transoral incisionless fundoplication. And that's been out since 2006, and it's been done around the world. <clears throat> there are billions of studies on this one, hundreds of thousands of studies on this one. There's probably a hundred studies on this operation, not, not as many. So, however, you'll see in a minute that they're all very, very similar operations. It's not a different operation, it's just a tool, a different tool. <clears throat> in the uh, 1950s, when we started doing the, the Nissen fund application, if you can imagine this being the esophagus, and this being the stomach, my hand being the diaphragm, that's how it would sit. And if we did a Nissen fund application based, and, and these are still done today, incidentally, I do them. I've been doing them since I trained at the Cook County Hospital. These are done all worldwide. We all, most general surgeons do that. And these is relatively new, and some of us do this. So if you can imagine this being the esophagus, this being the diaphragm, we make a long incision through your breastplate down around your belly button. We put a retractor in, reach, reach here 
breastplate up, reach up underneath your heart, because your heart sits right on that area there. Go reach up underneath your heart and size around the, the, these adhesions that are up there, these little, these little ligaments. And size around those, get our hand around the esophagus, mobilize the esophagus and pull it down below the diaphragm so it's from that position to that position. Then we sew the diaphragm up because we've made a big hole with our fist. And then we wrap the stomach around the esophagus and now we have what's called a Nissen fundoplication. You have the angle, this is all below the diaphragm, this is the angle, <clears throat> this is the valve, you can see the esophageal mucosa, and that's the distance. And that works, it really works, it works very well. It's a big operation, not many people want to have that done anymore, but we do do it sometimes. The laparoscopic operation is very similar to that in that if you can imagine this is your esophagus, this is your stomach, instead of a big incision, we make small incisions, place a camera, and then stab wounds under direct vision and go up there with instruments instead of our hands, go around the esophagus, pull it down below the diaphragm, suture up the diaphragm, and then wrap this stomach around there essentially the same way. It's just done endoscopically and it's much less traumatic. And there you have it the angle, the distance of the valve. And they work very well. They work almost too well. The problem with both of these operations is if they're done correctly, even though we do them floppy, we try not to make them too tight, we do things to protect you, many of these patients, as a matter of fact, I tell all of my patients that after they have it done, they will not be able to belch or vomit. <coughs> If I tell that to all my patients, and both of these, 80% of those patients never complain to me. They never complain to me. 20% come back and complain a lot. And I tell them, I told you so, and maybe they didn't realize it or whatever, or maybe they just couldn't tolerate it, but they complain forever about it. Now, the 80 that don't complain to me still have it. They just don't complain. And what happens when that occurs, if you can't belt or vomit, the problem is patients that have this trouble this area is always inflamed here because of the chronic reflux, even if they're taking a PPI or any kind of medication because that is irritated. And even if they don't feel they're having heartburn, the chemicals irritated and their brain says to their esophagus, get that stuff off of there because it's bothering me. And so people that have this problem swallow a lot of air. They swallow a lot of air and when they swallow the air, half the air goes up, the other half goes south. Now, when I fix this where they cannot belch or vomit any longer, now 100% of the air goes south, none goes up. So they have a lot of noises in their stomach, rumbling in their stomach. They, they call that borborygmy. They, have a, uh, they have, might have to get a larger pant size because they're bloated. If they drop something on the floor and they go to bend it over, they make noise. And if it's here in church, it's very embarrassing for them. So they don't like it. If somebody else talks to them three years later, they've come to me and they're not having reflux, but somebody else asks them, there's one study that showed this last year, how are you? They say, fine, we're not refluxing, we're doing good. Well, are you happy? 70% say, no, I'm not happy. Well, why aren't you happy? Well, I'm passing gas uncontrollably and I'm bloated all the time. I have to sleep in another room. My wife can't stand the bubbling. So. Would you have this operation again? A large percentage of those patients say, if I knew what I knew today, I would not have that operation. Now I know all that because I've been taking care of these same patients for the last 30 years. They come to me, they come back to me. I'm in a rural area, I'm away from them. They're not referred to me by other physicians. They, they're my patients and I see them and so I know how they feel. So this operation is called the endoscopic or transoral incisionalist fundoplication. And the way this operation is done is endoscopically, we have a device that goes down your esophagus, has an attachment on the side of it that pulls the esophagus below the diaphragm and then has an attachment that folds the diaphragm up. And lo and behold, it is the same operation. There's an angle, there's a distance, and there's the valve. And the, ex the difference is as you can see in the front, instead of being 360 degrees around the esophagus, esophagus like these two operations, it is about 300 to 270 degrees. So these patients can still belch or vomit. As a matter of fact, there's never been reported, as far as I know, in the 
15,000 plus patients that have had this operation around the world of anybody that have had a de novo gas bloat syndrome. Now some people have a lot of gas just because they have this problem, but they don't have that gas bloat syndrome, and so some of these patients may still have gas, but they gradually learn once this all heals and the reflux stop and that inflammation goes away, they gradually stop having that. So my patients that have had this, and we've done 350 of these so far, We've had not one that have reported that, not one in the recent reported literature in the United States. And so, and that is a transoral incisionless fundoplication. Thank you.